Hello and welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show where, hey, hey, remember last, remember last week when I said the show that's not profiled the single Nintendo published game since, uh, oh shit, ever. It's almost like I haven't planned this stuff. One thing you can certainly say about Nintendo is that they usually have a very high bar of quality on a polished technical level. Yes, yeah, some aspects might be divisive, you'd wish some characters and franchises would get their time to shine again, but for the most part, what they make is usually solid. There's been only a few scant times in the past decade where collectively everyone can point their fingers at a Nintendo published game and say, yeah, that's, that's not very good. Devil's Third is certainly one of those times. Now, there's a lot to unpack with this story, but first let me be clear, Nintendo did not in any way develop this weird pastiche of a hack and slash and shooting. There was simply the company that wound up having to publish it because woo, damn shit crappy crap, a whole lot of companies did not want to publish it. It took roughly eight years, I didn't stutter, eight years for Devil's Third to become a product you could buy with legal tender and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a what happened right there. Big mistake. I agree. As to who developed this infamous bit of software, well, that would be Valhalla Game Studios, and more specifically, Tobinobu Idigaki, and more specifically than that, the Japanese Tommy Wiseau. Alright, set the clock back. Now, aside from the fact that I just said that, more importantly, why did I say it? Well, a lot of the information about Devil's Third comes from an interview, an interview between Idigaki and Polygon, and it's one of the most batshit insane pieces of text ever committed to digital paper you're ever going to read. He goes on and on and on about nothing most of the time, making weird ass analogies and outlandish claims about game sales, reviews, and life in general. It's a goddamn journey, I'll tell you that for free. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let's slice and dice into one of the worst reviewed, lowest selling games of 2015 that Nintendo was basically shamed into publishing. Itagaki was, of course, the infamous director, or general as he fancies himself, of Team Ninja, a group within Tecmo that always seemed to be as concerned with making 40 second long intros for themselves as they were about making games. In the early 2000s, they decided to shack up with Big Daddy Gates, delivering exclusive games on Microsoft's OG machine for a number of years. This lasted until Itagaki suddenly left Tecmo in 2008, citing creative differences, or he got bored, or sexual harassment charges. Regardless, he decided to set up Valhalla most likely because he still wanted a cool long intro that showed stormy weather and took a number of producers and designers from Team Ninja along with him. Now, since he was on such good terms with Microsoft, they were the first logical burning oil drum in which he could warm his hands by. Microsoft even issued their own personal statement on the split between he and Tecmo. Tobinobu Itagaki has has decided to leave Tecmo and Team Ninja to pursue other opportunities. We thank Tobinobu Itagaki for the many years he has supported the Xbox as he has contributed immensely to the success of the video game industry as a whole. Now, it's not every day a company who does not employ a particular person still makes a statement on that person's change in position. Imagine when Cliffy B had to announce his company was a huge failure and he had to close it, and then all of a sudden Nintendo was like, oh man, yeah, super rough, dude. Yo, wish you luck, though. Peace. So, with that small gesture, it's easy to see why Microsoft would want to snap up Itagaki so he'd make them some cold, hard Japanese action games, or, or, or like some some bouncy, soft, creepy Japanese voyeur games. The thing is though, when Valhalla was all set up and Itagaki was ready to talk turkey and ask Uncle Bill to open up his checkbook, something unexpected happened. Microsoft was out of fucks to give for any game that was unsuited to have a bright purple Kinect sticker on its box. Yeah, despite those heartfelt words from Microsoft, they actually turned down Itagaki's proposal, as Microsoft had switched to the controller-free revolution, which lasted like two years. So yes, they weren't really an option anymore. But you know who was desperately trying to pivot their entire business model in a last ditch effort to avoid bankruptcy after their own similar what happened with the UDraw tablet? That's right, THQ, and boy, at that point they'd greenlight anything they could to get away from the stinky, childlike stink of their previous 
20 years of business, even if they couldn't afford to. This resulted in the tragic cancellation of things like a bunch of Finnish Saints Row games, Guillermo del Toro's Insane, and probably some other cool shit we don't even know about. Under THQ is when the game started to take shape, and even produced the first trailer, which in all honesty might have done a bit more harm than good in the long run. It was formally announced in the summer of 2010, and what we see here seems to be a stylish action game with multiple characters. Seems like it could be some type of multiplayer thing. Yeah, this seems like what an Itagaki would make. Speaking of which, he even managed to squeeze his own quote into the announcement as well. Who would have thought? In the past, I created four unique games, Dead or Alive, Ninja Gaiden, DOA Extreme, and Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword. That's that's being really generous. Anyway, he then said, Thus, this announcement will be the fifth all-new project of my lifetime. My heart pounds with anticipation every time I make this announcement. It's not something I get used to. Complacency is never an option for me. Okay, comp ton tits, buddy. Let's see. Anyway, work continued on the game for a further two years, with absolutely no updates until May of 2012, where THQ announced that, yeah, things were going poorly. Apparently, an outside third party had been supplying the engine for the game, but was never explicitly named, and that company just went out of business for some reason. You might want to chalk this one up to an act of God, since it was out of Valhalla and THQ's control, but... Nah, it's actually just called bad business. THQ's Brian Farrell stated that the profitability of Devil's Third was not competitive with our other releases. And that's probably because, firstly, they'd have to find a new engine, which costs time and money, and secondly, the yen was gaining in value over the American dollar at that point, further decreasing the game's prospects. THQ's head of hardcore gaming, Danny Bilson, was a big fan of the project and saw the potential in it and worked behind the scenes to still try to make it happen. It was at this time when they decided for now to switch the whole game over to the Phoenix engine, no, not that Phoenix, which was a custom Havoc-based bit of tech and was also what the then upcoming Darksiders 2 ran on. Another year passed before THQ announced to the world, who already knew, that yes, their anus was blue leading and they have no way to plug it up, so please help them for God's sake. But no one really came to the rescue, and instead a multitude of publishers simply swooped in and picked the carcass of THQ clean, with Nordic Games leaving with the fullest belly. What the hell is this? The bastards. Out of all those franchises that found a home though, Devil's Third was the odd game out, and instead of going to the warm, loving embrace of a new mama or papa, the rights to the franchise reverted back to Valhalla Game Studios, who could then do what they wanted with it. In the Polygon interview, Itagaki states that this was a difficult time, but Danny Bilson still had his back. How long was it when you signed with THQ until THQ closed as a company? I don't know, I'm a mathematician, but I'm no good at counting. But, what? but I worked with Danny until the very end, even after THQ closed. That's why he's at the very beginning of the staff credits of Devil's Third. Aww. So, left with an unfinished game, engine, and no publisher, it was back to the races to find someone who could get this thing to market. Enter a company you've never heard of, Dubic Entertainment! Worldwide! They were a South Korean publisher who had experience with FPSs and promised Itagaki they would get the game onto PCs and mobile platforms, for some reason, within the next fiscal year. But before all that, they had something to take care of, and that was going out of business. Ah, you can't make this up! This is why I love doing this show! Mm. Anyway, left with an unfinished game, engine, and no publisher, it was back to the races to get this thing to market. It is now 2014. Valhalla Game Studios is still somehow in business. I mean, I mean, business is a strong word because you actually need to produce a thing or provide some t type of service to be in business, ideally. But because, like, since their founding in 2008, they have released zero titles. Eight years, no games. How is that possible, you ask? Don't even ask. Okay, for real, though, when you have no money coming in, like, at all, how do you keep a 
company with multiple employees afloat, while Polygon was curious about the same thing. So, how are you able to keep the company going through that period of time? That must be one of the seven wonders of the world. It's through determination and honesty to each other. As you can see in this picture of our team, we are all happy. All of us believe that we are going to make something great and a savior would always come along. This is a picture of us in China with my sensei, Leijie Matsumoto. We have big supporters in China, Russia, the US, Canada, and elsewhere who stepped up to help us. What does that mean, Itagaki? Do, do, do you have some side hustles going on? Are you importing jeans from Korea? Where's that paper coming from? Regardless, it was at that year's E3 where Nintendo made a surprise announcement in one of their Treehouse streams. Devil's Third was back. It had a new look, or like, I guess this was the first look at it, technically, and it was a Wii U exclusive. It was shocking, you know, may maybe not Bayonetta too shocking, but it did surprise the niche number of fans who even remembered what Devil's Third was. Itagaki recalls how this all went down. After THQ closed, Valhalla CEO Satoshi Kanematsu approached Satoru Iwata at Nintendo and they picked up the game. The reason why Nintendo picked up the game is that they don't have enough strong online titles. Devil's Third is not a game that Nintendo could make internally, so we came in as their mercenaries to make a strong online game. Okay, yeah, sure, dude. Anyway, fans were still taken aback at the game because it was quite different from the admittedly light on substance trailer that had been released years ago under THQ. That version of it seemed to employ maybe parkour and melee combat into a multiplayer setting or was never really stated. Whereas now, the game seemed to have been turned into a standard single player action game like a lot of Team Ninja's previous efforts and featured a separate multiplayer component. The campaign was entirely focused on a Russian mercenary named Ivan, whose task was saving the world from falling satellite debris or, or something. To do so, he'll have to utilize either his clunky FPS shooting mechanics or his clunky melee mechanics to take down frustrating level after frustrating level. Oh, and there's bats too. Lots of the bats. While people were happy that the game had been resurrected, they were less happy at this change of gameplay style, and were even less happy than then at the idea of it being a Wii U exclusive, which was the style at the time. But it just so happened that Nintendo were the only ones willing to publish it. I, I mean, Nintendo of Japan were the only ones willing to publish it. So, we're coming upon the final hurdle in this sad journey of Devil's Third. Nintendo of America seemed to hate the game. This was a deal that was brokered by their counterparts in Japan, so when builds were sent to Nintendo HQ in Redmond, Washington, I can only imagine what they thought of it. It now ran on Unreal Engine 3. Not very well, mind you. It was glitchy, had awful textures, poor controls, input lag was just plain ugly, and by 2014 standards, was not all that exciting to play. Japanese action games, and hell, even Western third-person shooters had kind of pushed beyond what Itagaki had been making in 2008, so Devil's Third was now frantically trying to play catch-up. Already put in a difficult position by the previous company closures and engine changes, it was the one other facet that Valhalla failed to consider. Their piece of software had been trapped in this bubble of uh, unreleasing for almost a decade, with many trends, technology, and innovations completely passing them by. E3 2014 came and went without any further updates, and when Nintendo failed to mention the game at all during the following E3, people began to suspect something was up. Every asshole in this place knows I'm working for you. Might be a few minutes. It was then where a proverbial ping pong match between the media and Nintendo began. One side claimed one thing while the other deflected. The game was cancelled. No, it's not. You're not publishing it. We never said we were. So where is it? It's coming. When? I don't know. It came to a head when NOA simply stated that they were seeking out another publishing partner for Devil's Third in North America, because they would not be handling those duties. Problem with that is that Nintendo couldn't find anyone else to handle those duties. Why? Well, two reasons. A Wii U exclusive was a tough sell in 2015, so yeah, there's that. And two, those potential publishers probably played it. With no takers, Nintendo, knowing that the small but vocal fanbase still cared about Devil's Third, wouldn't let them live it down if they didn't release the game, especially since the Japanese and European branches had. 
So Nintendo basically just threw their hands and gave up. They relented, made it available as a download, and shipped physical copies. All 10,000 or less of them. And just like Nintendo predicted, the critical reception was similarly abysmal, with many review outlets citing it as one of the worst games of the year, and considerably lowered Nintendo's own Metacritic score in the process. What did Itagaki think of all those harsh reviews? Well, the reviews for Devil's Third weren't stellar. The general view was that the game was stuck in the late Xbox 360 era. Let me try to explain this in parts. First, the reason the reviews were so poor. I have analyzed the reason. The game was designed to be a massive shooter, so it would be fun if there were at least a thousand players in the game, but Nintendo didn't set up online matches for reviewers, so there was no way for reviewers to experience the online mode as we designed it, and they reviewed the game based mostly on the single player story mode. If it had been Microsoft that had published the game, they would have given the game to a group of 500 players who had signed an NDA to play for the reviewers to experience the massive online mode, but NOA didn't do that. Which is, of course, a bunch of of bullshit. In fact, the little praise Devil's Third did get was because of the in-depth multiplayer, which featured tons of characters, gear, maps, and modes. It was still a bit janky, but there was a lot of content. However, the game's campaign was so maligned, what with the poor optimization, voice acting, controls, graphics, levels, and general gameplay that reviewers were left with no choice but to score the game accordingly. Itagaki seems to have never addressed this, and instead focuses his criticisms elsewhere. They couldn't play the multiplayer, so there's no value to the review of someone who's evaluating a piece of art with blindfolds on. That was 95% of the negative criticism towards the game. No, it wasn't. The remaining 5% was by people who wanted to build credibility by criticizing the game. One person wrote a negative review, and NOA didn't do anything to stop or change that review, so others followed suit. So I don't really believe that the reviews were credible. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Anyway, Nintendo pulled the plug on the game servers less than a year later, which honestly was probably longer than it deserved. With that being said, the game's chunky multiplayer mode technically got another chance in the spotlight because it was cut out of the single player game and sold as a separate SKU on PCs in Japan, published by Nexon and dubbed Devil's Third Online, which um, yeah, I don't think you can play and I'd be surprised if it still works. That all happened in 2016. Since then, what has Valhalla worked on? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, I think. It, it, it seems like another team with ties to them called Soleil might have made Naruto Shinobi strike or, or thing. I mean, I don't know. Yet, they are still operational, Valhalla. I, I guess out of all of Itagaki's friends across Russia, China, and Canada, they're still helping them? Speaking of Canada, there's, wait, there's also Valhalla Game Studio Vancouver, and it's actually now their headquarters? I, I can't, I can't anymore with that. I'm done. Tapping out. Ugh. While you think of any other mystifying misfires you'd like me to cover in the future, write them in the comments, check out the Patreon, and I'll leave you with one more parting word from our sunglass wearing god of oatmeal cookies himself. When asked about the future of Valhalla and what platforms Itagaki is hoping to target for future releases, he calmly replied, I think that the future is stormy. It's difficult to see beyond that. See you next time and thanks for watching.